Good morning. Welcome to another edition of our Newport News Church of Christ Morning Bible Study. So happy that you're with us this morning. Glad that you're able to join us on this rainy Sunday morning. It's been raining for the past couple of days and it's still raining today. Uh, we're thankful, though, that God has blessed us to open our eyes this morning and see this day and to be able to be with you and to come and to present Another portion of God's word through our Bible study of the faith lessons of Abraham in the book of Genesis will be in Genesis chapter 18 this morning. So I hope that you'll grab your Bibles and uh, sit back and, and get ready to study with us for the next 45 minutes or so. We're in the book of Genesis chapter 18, looking at the life lessons of Abraham. And we'll look at this morning, Abraham and the three strangers, Abraham and the three strangers or uh, in other words, the biblical version of guess who's coming to dinner. And so Abraham is going to entertain uh, three strangers and three uh, guests this morning. And we want to look at that and pull some uh, life lessons out of that and, uh, and, and get some deeper meaning into the, the, uh, the meaning behind these three visitors that came uh, to Abraham. We know in scriptures that uh, Abraham uh, was the friend of God. Abraham was the friend of God. Uh, Abraham is given this title in 2 Chronicles 20, verse 7, Isaiah 41 and 8, and James 2 and 23. And he's the only person in the Bible to have this title, to be known as the friend of God. Now, Lazarus was a friend that Jesus called Lazarus and Mary and Martha his friends in John chapter 11, 11, Lazarus, our friend, sleepeth, and they had he uh, left up and went down to uh, Bethany to go see uh, Lazarus and uh, he, to go see Mary and Martha because their brother had died. And so they were great friends of, of Jesus. But Abraham is called the friend of God. Now today, all those who believe on the Lord and obey, we can be his friends. When he was with, Jesus was with his disciples, uh, before uh, when they were doing after the Last Supper and the time they were gathered before he would go out to the Mount of Olives and pray, uh, Jesus uh, in talking to them said, "You are my friends, but you are my friends. What if you obey? If you heed my commandments, listen to my words, and do the things that I command you, then you are my friends indeed." No longer, Jesus said, "Will I call you servants? But I call you friends." And so the servant is a lot lower. Servant just does what his master says. But when you are a friend, that's putting us on a, an equal footing with, with our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. But we can only be his friend if we do the things that he says. If we listen to his word and, uh, and obey him, then Jesus says, you are my friends indeed if you will do those things. As friends, we can share his love and we can share his fellowship and we can know his will. Moses was another person that had a friendly relationship with God. And Moses, we talked about, we had a lesson a, a few months back. Uh, Moses wanted to know more than what just God had done, but he wanted to actually know God's ways. He wanted to know his will, what he wanted him to do, and what his will was. But he also, Moses wanted to know more. He wanted to know his ways. He wanted to be more intimately uh, familiar with God and to know his ways as well as his will. Today, uh, we want to know the Lord's will and we want to know his ways. Paul told us in Ephesians that we should understand, first of all, what the will of the Lord is. The more we know the will of God, the more we can pray within the will of God. We, can, we know how to ask for God. We know how to approach God because when we know his will, we know what his ways, what he will do, what he has done, what he will do in the future. Uh, and what he's even doing for us now, then it makes us a better uh, Christians. We know what to ask for. We don't ask for things that are not in his will. We don't ask for things that are not part of his ways. We don't ask for things that he hasn't done or that things that he won't do. So that helps us to line up with our Lord and, and Savior, Jesus Christ, and with our God, our Father, because we understand what their wills. And so we, and then um, because of that, then we can be on friendly relationships with them. We can be and uh, approach him on a friendly relationship. We don't want to be in enemies. We don't want to have enmity. We'll become enemies of Christ and of our Father. Jesus said, he of them that are not with me are against me, all right? And so uh, he that, if, so we can be against God. He separates himself away from us because he can't have anything to do with sin. But those of us who seek in righteousness and try to live righteously and obey 
our father, then we can be on a friendly relationship. And then Hebrews says we can approach him with boldness uh, because that enmity is not there. When we are beset by an unseen foe, we are befriended by an unseen friend. Uh, Brother Mike Brandt did a wonderful study on what a friend we have in Jesus. Jesus is a friend like no other. He's one that can enrich our lives. He can make our lives better. And so when we have unseen foes, and Paul would say we fight not against flesh and blood, but against spiritual wickedness in high places. And so when we fight those type of battles, then we have an unseen friend, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. This morning, as we look at chapter 18, uh, Bob just covered last week in chapter 17, Sarah and Abraham's name change, the renewal of that promise and commitment. And so now in eight, chapter 18, we're going to see Abraham ministering in three different areas. Abraham uh, ministered in three different areas, and we see that friendship as we established that Abraham was a friend of God. So friendship involves ministry, and in Genesis chapter 18, we will find that Abraham uh, ministers in three different areas, or we find Abraham ministering in three different areas. First of all, in the first part of the chapter, verses 1 through 8, we'll see that Abraham is going to minister to the Lord himself. And then in the second part of the chapter, we see that Abraham is going to be is going to minister to his home to his wife and to all those that are in his home and then third in the last part of the chapter abraham is going to minister to the lost world we'll see that in his concern and his compassion for sodom and gomorrah as these visitors visit him and as they leave his uh, abode and turn their attention toward the plain and toward the cities of the plain and toward their attention toward sodom and gomorrah we'll see abraham's compassion and the care for the lost souls in those areas. So Abraham is going to minister in uh, three different areas we'll see in this chapter this morning. First of all, we point out is that uh, we have an, an, a theophany, a theophany, and in scriptures and in the Old Testament, we see a manifestation in which God's presence is made visible and recognizable, an appearance of God. Uh, we have a similar theophany that takes place uh, in, uh, in Daniel, remember in that Daniel when they were thrown into the fiery furnace and they said, you know, they had, they put the three boys in there, but oh, I see a fourth one and the fourth one is like unto the son of man. That's a theophany. That's an appearance of, of God's presence and appearance um, uh, in, in, the, in the flesh. And so we see those manifestations and we know those manifestations because we know those to be the Lord, the appearance of the Lord, the, the the pre-carnate before he came down and was made flesh and dwelt among us that we read in John 1 and 1. Uh, in the beginning was the word, the word was with God and the word was God. So he be, and the word became flesh and it dwelt among him. We beheld his glory as, a, as the glory only of the begotten uh, of the father, full of grace and truth. So we see this theophany that occurs. God communicated with and appeared to Abraham in various ways. And I have the text there. In different ways back in chapter 12 we see that's when God first appeared to Abraham told him to leave Ur of the Chaldeans and to move and then later on after uh, his father Terah died he appears to him again and tells him to, to get away from his kinfolk and leave again that's in chapter 12 and chapter 13 we have uh, an appearance to where he's first told about the promise about him being great and being a and that uh, if he would look at the dust of the ground that he would be that his descendants would be great as the dust on the ground. If you can count the dust on the ground, you'll be great. That's in Genesis chapter 13. Then in Genesis chapter 15, he gets another token that if he would look up and see the stars, then his descendants would be great as the stars. And so that's in Genesis chapter 15. Of course, we get the uh, the uh, cutting uh, uh, a ceremony there that where they were where, the, where God made that com uh, commitment to him, that agreement that cutting of animals and cut the animals in two spreadable part. Abraham was in a deep sleep and God walked between those two animals to signify uh, a commitment a uh, between a contract and commitment between God and Abraham of the promises he made. And then again in Genesis chapter 17 where brother Bob was at last week, we find another appearance to Abraham uh, and their names were changed from Abram to Abraham, father of the great nation and from Sarai to Sarah. 
So those are the appearances and the ways that God had communicated to Abraham in various ways. In Genesis 18, there's a special theophany occurs. The Lord uh, and two angels are uh, gonna visit uh, 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 Abraham in human form. Abraham shows himself to be a man of great hospitality during this particular visit. Ministry must first of all be to the Lord. We see that Abraham in the first part ministered to the Lord. And so a ministry must first of all be to the Lord. Let's look at Genesis chapter 18 and we'll look at verses one through eight. And the Lord appeared unto him in the plains of Mam Mamre, and he sat in the tent door in the heat of the day. And he lifted up his eyes and looked, and lo, three men stood by him. And when he saw them, he ran to meet them from the tent door and bowed himself toward the ground. And he said, my Lord, if now I have found favor in thy sight, pass not away, I pray thee from thy servant. Let a little water, I pray you, be fetched and wash your feet and rest yourselves under the tree. And I will fetch a morsel of bread and comfort ye heart, comfort your hearts after ye shall pass on, for therefore are ye come to your servant. And they said, so do as thou hast said. And Abram hastened into the tent unto Sarah and said, make ready quickly three measures of fine meal knead it and make cakes upon the hearth. And Abraham ran unto the herd and he fetched a calf tender and good and gave it unto a young man and he hastened to dress it. And he took butter and he took mil and milk and the calf which he had dressed and set it before them. And he stood by them under the tree and they did eat. Ministry, first of all, must be to the Lord. All ministry must be first to the Lord. We find the Jewish priests, their responsibility to minister to the Lord in the book of Exodus, their job was to the, the, the Levitical priesthood and the Levites and the priests, their job was to minister to the Lord continuously. That's all they did. They did not work. They did not get a, a, a portion of land. They did not uh, uh, have a, a portion of land that was given to them. Their portion was, the, was given to them by the people, by the people's offerings and the sacrifices that were brought. That's where the Levites got their portion because their job was to serve continuously before the Lord in the tabernacle. We see God's servants in the early church. Remember um, when, uh, when uh, Peter and James and them, an uh, issue was brought to them uh, in the church and they said, we cannot leave uh, uh, prayer and, and the things that we have to do spiritually to go wait on tables because they realized their job was to serve the Lord. And they were, they counted it a, a joy to be able to serve and to suffer uh, in his name. Also Colossians 3, 23, 24, it says that whatever, whatever you do, do it heartily as to the Lord and not to men for you serve the Lord Jesus Christ. So this lets us know that in all aspects of our life, our mindset is like, I'm not serving them. And so that's why us as Christians, them people on your job can't get under your nerve. They can't get under your skin. They can't ruffle me because I'm not working for them. They may, yeah, my checks may have your employer's name on it and, and, and may come from their account, bank account into your account. But you come into the attitude as Christians, wherever we shine, wherever we work in the world, we serve in the Lord. So that's why the people can't get us because we serve somebody greater than them. So we're going to always treat with respect. We're always going to act with respect and carry ourselves in the, in the right manner because we serve the Lord God. Paul told us whatever we do, do it heartily as to the Lord. So we're going to be honest. We're going to be on time. We're going to do all those things that we're supposed to do because we're serving the Lord. Yeah, th that might be our immediate boss or who we got to report to, but we don't work for them. You know, we work for the Lord. And so that's the kind of mindset that we have, that we serve and we work uh, for the Lord. The Lord and two angels visit Abraham. And so Abraham doesn't know who they are when they arrive. He just sees three men, but uh, it's the Lord and two angels that visit Abraham when he's in his tent uh, in Mamre. Abraham was taking his daily rest 
when he saw three angels approaching. Now, it's significant those angels, the Lord and those angels appeared in the middle of the day. Now, those of you who have been on deployment, have been in the Middle East, been in that region, nobody is out in the middle of the day. It's 130 degrees in the shade. Nobody's out walking around. And so back in this time, in the middle of the day, they will probably get up early in the morning, do things, take care of their herds and cattle. Maybe a little later as the sun's kind of going down, they might go out. But in the middle of the day, you kind of resting. You kind of taking it easy when the, in the heat of the day, when the sun is at its highest peak and it's bearing down on you and it's 120, 130, uh, nobody's out walking around. Nobody's traveling at that time. A lot of times, uh, like in the desert, those herdsmen, they would travel at night when it was cool and then they would build their tents and kind of rest during the day, but they would travel like at night or early morning. So it's significant. Uh, Abraham is kind of taking his rest in the middle of the day and he sees these men approaching, which would be unusual because just people wouldn't be traveling in the middle of the day in the heat of the day like that. There's three strangers were the Lord Jesus Christ and two angels. Uh, there was nothing about their appearance that told Abraham who they were but as he fellowship with them, he learned that he was entertaining royal visitors. His ministry to the Lord was so acceptable that we ought to follow his example, follow the example that Abraham set in his ministry. Now we want to notice some points about that ministry. We want to understand some things about this ministry, about how Abraham, how he ministered to the Lord. And there's some points that we could take uh, to heart ourselves. And we see here a little description, uh, a depiction of how Abraham himself is sitting here ministering. We see him serving. You can see Sarah in the back as she looks through. But Abraham took a personal uh, uh, interest and a personal move to uh, serve uh, uh, these uh, visitors. We look at Abraham. Uh, Abraham served the Lord. His first thing he did, he served the Lord personally. Abraham was 99 years old. Uh, and wealthy, he could have called on his steward or one of his 300 servants. Now, that is just, ponder that for a minute. Abraham, he's 99, and he's a wealthy sheep. If you have, if you ever seen movies like Lawrence of Arabia, different movies set in those desert scenes, and, and Abraham is a wealthy, very wealthy sheep. He was enriched uh, in Egypt. Remember when he went down to Egypt uh, during the famine, and then uh, as he came, when he got there, they gave him a lot of gifts and him and Lot a lot of gifts because they wanted Sarah, who he said was his sister. They wanted to take Sarah for his wife. So they were giving Abraham a lot of stuff. And then when they found out, it was discovered that this, uh, and because of the plagues that came on Pharaoh and his household, he realized that this is somebody's wife. And so they gave Sarah back to Abraham and then gave him a lot of stuff and servants to leave and get out of here. Hey, look, take some more stuff. If we've made you mad and offended your God, hey, take this and, and just go. So Abraham is very rich. He's a, he's a rich sheep. And so ponder this. Uh, just think out there in the desert. Uh, he has a steward of his house, and he has 300 servants. The reason why him and Lot separated is because he Abraham had a lot of servants to take care of all his cattle, and Lot had a lot of servants and people that were taking care of of his affairs and taking care of his cattle. And so the two of them couldn't strive together. There wasn't enough room. They were bumping heads. And so they separated because they were brethren and they didn't want anything between their herdsmen to, to filter over into their relationship. But Abraham has 300 servants. Abraham out there in Mamre is like, he's like a little city in himself. Just him and his family are like a little village, a little, little floating city of about 300 people. So I think that's amazing. But Abraham served personally. Abraham didn't call his steward. Uh, Abraham didn't call one of his servants. He could have said, snapped his fingers and, and said, hey, hey, go out there and see what them men want. Uh, when those men approached, Abraham jumped up and he went out to meet them. He rushed out to greet them. Abraham could have laid in his tent and, and act like he was asleep. It's the middle of the day where they would take their little naps in that in those uh, areas. Uh, and you go to other places uh, like in Spain and stuff where they have a little afternoon siesta. They open up real early in the morning and work till about uh, the, the midday. And, and, and then they go home and take their lunch. They take a nap. Then they come back and, and stay over till later in the evening. 
So Abraham could have took a little siesta, could have been taking a nap, act like he was asleep, or he could have sent somebody else, hey, could have snapped his finger, hey, y'all go out there, there's some men coming up on the plane, go out there and see what they want. I go and, and take some water to him and, and go take him. No, Abraham did it personally. He got up. He went out there and greeted the men as they came and then said all the things. Hey, let me let me come and refresh you with some water. Let me get a morsel of bread. And, and, and so Abraham served personally. And then once the men sat down, it looks from the text that Abraham was the one that was doing the serving. So just think of that mindset. Think of the mindset of a servant. You know, having all these servants, having all these people at his disposal, Abraham didn't rely on them. Abraham could have just sat back and, and could have sat down like he was one of the guests and had somebody come in and serve. It would have been his right. They were his servants. They worked for him. But Abraham did it personally to show interest, to show hospitality to these three visitors. He doesn't know who they are, but he took the, we, he took the initiative and he served personally. He said, let me get this for you. Let me get that. Let me fetch a morsel of bread. Sit down. Let me refresh you. And so that was a custom. And in the Middle East and in different parts of the world, that is a custom. Hospitality is a custom. I've traveled to uh, those locations and uh, just going on trips, like just going out to go to shops and, you know, looking at different shops and going to shop. You know, as Americans, we just want to come in there. We want to get down to business. Hey, I want to look at this. Give me that. Let me look at that coat. Let me look at this. And, and, and their mentality in some places were different. They were like, no, no, hold it. My friend, come on in. Uh, let me get some tea. Let me get you some refreshment. Come in, have a seat. They would go and send somebody and they would come back with tea. And you would sit down and drink some tea. They might give you a little snack. Say, okay, now that you refresh, now we'll sit down and talk. A lot of times as Americans, we want to do business. You know, we want to do business over dinner, over lunch, have these little lunch meetings. And, and talk, or we want to have business meeting. Uh, in, in other places around the world, hospitality is first. No, we talk business tomorrow. Right now, we're going to sit down and eat. We're going to break bread. Uh, they want to get to know you. Let's get to know each other. Let's break down the social barriers and, and kind of get to know each other, kind of eat a meal and kind of fellowship together. Then we're ready to go and talk business. Then we're ready to do this. They don't in different places in the world, they don't want to talk before they sit down and have a meal until you're refreshed, until they've taken care of you. Um, even in this country, I remember as, as a child growing up, I grew up in a minister's home. And so that means we did a lot of visiting, went to a lot of people's homes. And, and, and a time gone by, I remember you didn't go to a house where they didn't offer you something, some hospitality. I mean, it would be no self-respecting woman would have you come into her house and they didn't offer you some coffee. And, and there was, and I don't know, I don't know what happened, Myra. There was always a piece of pound cake. There was always, they always had some cake. They, I think they made cake every week. They made some kind of cake, some kind of cookies. There was something baked. And when people came by, because people back then, people used to go to people's houses more and visit. So you always had something ready for the visitors. When people came by, you could always offer them some coffee, some tea, some, some, some sweet tea. And, and, and then you go back and cut up a little cup piece of cake and you come out, you just refresh people. You brought them some refreshment that was customary. You know, now you go to people's house, your stomach could be growling and they won't offer you a morsel or nothing. You know, they'd be like looking at you. They'd be picking their teeth. They just ate. They, hey, have you eaten? No. You visit, you gotta go to Popeye's and get your own chicken, brother. Ain't nobody giving you nothing these days. But back then, I can remember a time as a boy, we didn't go to somebody's house where they didn't offer us something. They, it was just customary. Come on in. Let me get you some coffee. Let me get you some tea. Let me get you a cake. And if you came around the midtime, have you had lunch yet? Man, they come back. You would think that the woman had started from scratch, but she'd go in the refrigerator and come out with chicken and greens and all kind of stuff. And they would throw together some leftovers. Man, it, it tastes like it was a freshly cooked meal. But that was hospitality. People did those kind of things when you came by, and, and it was a personal thing. Uh, now today, our hospitality is: you come over to somebody's house, they might call, "Hey, let's call DoorDash, let's call Uber Eats," and they call somebody to bring something to the house. Ain't nobody cooking no more. Nobody's making cooking, and nobody got cookies and, and fresh break bread. You might open up some packaged stuff, but back then people had baked stuff. They women had. A cake, always a cake hanging around the house, some cookies or something, because they expected to be able to entertain people when they came to the house. So Abraham, when he got up, man, he got up and, hey, let me get you some water. Let me refresh you. 
And in the Middle East, you think being out in that hot desert and you're hot and, and then you're walking with your sandals. So the first thing you do, you come into somebody's house, they first thing, hey, take off your sandals. They bring out a basin. Like remember our Lord with his disciples, he washed their feet. That was a customary thing. That was to refresh you, to wash your feet. Uh, you go to some restaurant, they come out and they have a bowl, they have a little thing with some water and you can rinse your fingers off. They bring you a towel to re rinse yourself off and you can wipe your face. So when you come out of that hot sun and in the desert, you need to be refreshed. You got sand and dust over you and they wore robes where they could kind of cover their face, but you want to sit down. They would give you some water to kind of wash your feet and clean your feet off and kind of wipe your face and, and refresh yourself. So Abraham took a personal interest in bringing these things out to help refresh these visitors. Abraham also, uh, also he ministered uh, uh, professionally. He, he also ministered immediately to these men. Uh, he mentioned, he, he immediately, Abraham was a man of faith and faith does not delay when it comes to serving the Lord. He did not ask the visitors to sit and wait. He didn't ask them to sit down and wait. Abraham brought them in and immediately started tending to their needs, brought water and got things and, and immediately ministered. So. As, as people of faith, we don't wait, we don't hesitate. Uh, we bring people in and we, and we immediately tend to them. You would go to somebody's house, like I say, back in the day, and the first thing you come in, come in, have a seat there, make sure you had a comfortable place to sit. And then the first thing out of their mind, can I get you something? Remember that? That was the next thing. Come in, first of all, they made sure you came in and got seated and got comfortable. And the next thing out your mouth was, can I get you something? Can I get you some coffee? Can I get you something? Now you go to somebody's house, they have you waiting and you parched, you might be thirsty and you might not never get that offer. You may never get that, hey, can we bring something? But that was, you come to somebody's house, that was customary. Come in, have a seat. Let, let me get you some. What, what, let me get you some tea. Let me get you some coffee. Let me, you, you need some water. You know, they realize you just coming from outside and now we got AC and we got comfort in our homes. But back in the day, not everybody's car had AC. I remember years back, not everybody had AC. AC was a luxury. You know, your AC was two windows down 55 miles an hour. That was your air conditioning. So you might come in on a hot day. You know, you need some water. You need to be refreshed because not everybody had the luxury at a night car with AC. Now, uh, today, all of these things are standard. Everybody got AC. Everybody got power windows. Nobody know what this is anymore. You do this to some kids, they don't know what that means. We know that meant roll the window down. Roll your glass down. Everybody got power windows. Everything's power. Power locks. You remember, you used to have to go and pull the lock up. We got all these conveniences now. And so we've kind of lost some of that hospitality. But people came in and immediately would tend to your needs. What we need? Can we get you some coffee? Can we get you some? And then they would settle down in and for your visit. Abraham ministered to the Lord speedily. Speedily. He ran to meet the visitors in verse 2. He got up as they were coming. He didn't wait. Like, who that? Who, who, who that coming back in here? You go to some people's house now and 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 you don't stay, no signs of life. They see you coming and they hide. They back there peeping through curtains and peeping out. Who's that? Who they coming at? Is that somebody from the church? Who coming up in here? Shh, shh, shh. And they get real quiet. Shh, turn that TV down. Turn cut that TV down, girl. Shh. And they go away. They looking out the window at you. Damn. They ain't trying to have you come over here. I don't want to see them. Uh, it, yeah, that's Brother Sons. That's Brother Maxwell and Brother Steven. I don't want to see them. Ah, shh, cut, turn the TV off. Shh, get everybody real quiet. They, don't even, they won't even walk because they don't want the floorboards to creak. Everybody stop. Stand still. And that house go dead. And then after you quit knocking or something, and then, they, then you go away. Then that, whoo, that was close, man. Folk don't want you coming up in there. But Abraham was was obviously Abraham got up. Abraham ran out to greet his visitors. Hey, how y'all doing? It made them feel welcome. Uh, he hastened to tell Sarah, came in, come on in. And then he went, Sarah, get this. Let's, let's get some, put some bread on and break some bread. And back then they would make the bread over their little heart, the flat bread. And, and then he goes out and he gets one of his young, he goes out and gets one of his young men and gets one of the calves. I mean, this was this food was fresh. The bread was baked right there. Sarah, go bake some bread and then go get a calf. Now, now, do you understand what it takes? You know, we go to the store and just get some packages and the meat already been butchered and cut up, all wrapped in a nice package. We take it out and can cook it. No, they were starting from scratch. They had to go get the animal, pick one out, cut him up, 
dress him, then cook him on the spot like that. That's the kind of hospitality. We'd be like, Lord, I ain't doing all that. I ain't doing all that. Cutting up, cooking. No, I ain't doing all that. But Abraham did all of that and got the young man, dressed it up, cooked it. So, I mean, we got it in the scriptures, but we don't know how much time that takes. It probably took a couple of hours to get all that going. But in the meantime, they had time for conversation. Abraham served the Lord generously, and he gave him the best that he had. Abraham, like, hey, let's go get this. Let's go get that. Let's go get this. Let's go get the bread. It wasn't like, you know, the day you come over, it might scare up some, uh, well, let's see what we got in the cabinet. Yeah, let's see, we got some leftovers. See, then, like I said, in the time past, people plan for guests coming over. So you always had some extra. Big mama always had some extra, always cooked up some extra stuff. They made big meals, so there was always leftovers. There was always some stuff in there. So if somebody dropped by, man, they could come and pull it out. You thought they just cooked it. No, that's just leftovers. Because big mama didn't just make enough for just for right now. She made a big pot of stuff and a big pot. So, you know, you could come back and eat on it. If some guests came over, they could pull out and, and set a spread out there. You would think they had just cooked it for you. But that's that's how people planned ahead. They expected company. So there was always a little something in the cupboard, always something in the cabinet that was always there, ready to be able to serve. And, and they would, and people would come out and they would give you the best they had. They would give you whatever they had, they give you the best. They, they, they would make sure that you was comforted. Abraham served the Lord cooperatively and involved the ministry of others. So Abraham worked with Sarah, his wife. And then he went over there and got the, 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 the animal to, and then he got one of his young men to take it. So he worked cooperatively. Abraham was the lead and then he worked, his wife was there working and then he had one of his servants along working with him. And so those are the different ways that Abraham served the Lord. Christian hospitality, and we see here a little um, depiction of Abraham serving, uh, Abraham's pouring. Now look at that, brethren, Abraham out there pouring. He didn't sit back and with his feet popped up on his, on his easy boy and say, Sarah, come out here and bring these men some water. No, Sarah back there making bread. So Abraham's out showing his hospitality. Abraham out making sure the men have water and some stuff to drink. So Abraham's got a lead role, brethren. There's no shame in having a lead role in hospitality in your home. Your wife might be in the back doing some things and fixing some things up. Ain't no, ain't no shame in, in putting the towel on and making sure your guests are taken care of. Sometimes, brethren, we, 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 people come over and we act like we wanted a guest. Woman's just sweating and running back and forth doing all this stuff and we act like we a guest. No, brother, this is your house. This was Abraham's house. Abraham took a lead role and being hospitable. He took, his wife was back there working. They were working cooperatively. It was a team. So brother, and you work too, it's your house. You show the hospitality. You set the standard in your home for hospitality. You be a vessel of hospitality along with everybody else in your home. Hospitality is important. Hebrews 13 uh, verse one and two references this event. He says, be not forgetful to entertain strangers because some have entertained angels. You don't know who you entertain it. So be not forgetful to entertain strangers. Uh, and and it's, it's interesting, I, as I looked at that, the Lord cares about the stranger. The Lord cares about them. Now, this country, and, and uh, even not just here, but around the world, we're getting stingy. We don't care about the stranger no more. There are people who are strangers. There are people who are sojourning. There are places around the world that are war-torn, and, and people are now refugees, and people are just stranded without nothing. And, and these people are walking, trying to get away from a hostile situation, a war that then tore up their country, tore up their homes, and they've been forced to grab their kids and whatever they can put on their back and try to walk to another country. But do you know that other country looks and go, oh, we don't want all them people in our country, and they will close their borders. Shut their borders up, close their fences in. They don't want them in their country. They look at them as some refuge, as some trash. We here. Our country knew some people was coming from South America and we started talking, hey, Mexico, you better stop them. Better stop them, don't let them come up here. So our world today, we don't have a good view of the stranger. There's some people that are, are, are strangers and refugees, not of their own doing. It's because some stuff going on in their country. Stuff has been uh, shut up and they, their opportunities have been closed off. There's danger they're worried about, they can't live for their life. Their kids get snatched up in the gangs. 
So parents get up and make their kids and will walk by foot thousands of miles to get their kids to a place where they can live a better life. But then us with plenty pockets running over, we got two and three of everything. And then we shut our doors. We shut our bowels of compassion and we don't care about the stranger. I'm just here to tell you today, God cares about the stranger. He cares about the stranger. In Jeremiah chapter seven last week, one of the indictments that the Lord had against those Jews is that they were mistreating the strangers in their country. That was the first thing he said. Y'all don't care about the immigrants. Y'all don't care about the strangers, those that are living within your borders. If they ain't a Jew, they're a stranger. The Jews didn't care about them. And then y'all don't care about the fatherless. Y'all don't care about the orphans and the widows. You don't care about all these people. And so the Lord has something to say about the stranger. So Abraham's example is important. You don't know who you entertain it. So don't be forgetful to entertain strangers because some have entertained angels. Hospitality is an important part of Christian ministry as we see in Romans 12 and 13, 1 Peter 4 and 9. You can look at those references. It is one of the requirements for leaders in the local church. Uh, the, the leaders in the local church have to be given to what? Hospitality. That's one of, the, one of the credentials of being a leader. You can't be a leader and be inhospitable. You have to be a, 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 a leader in hospitality. One of the quality, uh, qualifications to be a leader is hospitality, the husband and the wife. You got to be able to provide a place and, and look out for others. By lovingly serving others, we serve the Lord Jesus Christ, as the Lord would say in Matthew 25, verses 34 through 40. And we promote the spread of God's truth through our hospitality. Uh, Jesus told his disciples, by this men will know that. He, he said, do you know what I've just done for you when they washed their feet? He said, I've given you an example. By this will people know that you are my disciples. That's going to be your calling card, not because of what you say out of your mouth, but be what you do. By this will all men know that you belong to me, that you come for me is one of the signs is what? How do you treat other people? How do you treat the stranger? How do you treat guests? How do you treat people that you don't know? That's going to be your calling card. Do you show love is what Jesus was saying. So Christian hospitality is important. And I fear Brother Maxwell is becoming a lost art. We are losing the art of hospitality because our lives are so spread out. We live miles apart. And so we don't live in this close community anymore. And so we don't just come into contact with each other like that anymore. So I think we're losing. We're not passing that hospitality on to the next generation. Are we passing it on to our kids? But have our kids seen us? Now the, our, our kids will see it if we've done it in our home. Have we taken in people? Have we fed people and had them over for dinner and done things? Have we gone out of the way? And I'm sitting here looking at a family right now that practices hospitality. I'm not going to call their names, but I'm looking right at them. I know a family that people come here for the first time as a visitor. This family takes them out to dinner. That very day, they meet him and say, hey, why don't y'all come and go to eat dinner with us? Hospitality. But instead, we're looking at while it's like, oh, the check a little tight. Uh, uh, we, we, we get together with you sometime. We do that. Hey, yeah, we got, let's get together sometime. And guess what? Sometime never happens. Sometime never happens. But when we show people, you may only have that one time. Them people, you may only see them that one time that you come in contact. They may only visit this congregation that one time. So that's the time to show hospitality. That's the time. Hey, the, we, we can forego some other stuff. We're going to take these people out and, and, and show. They might need you. They might need in your conversation. You might be able to talk to them and help them and bless them in their lives. It might just be that, that one meeting that they need with some good people to help them in their lives. So you got one time to show some hospitality. So don't neglect it. Don't put it off. Show hospitality. It's an important part of our Christian duty in our service. And not just to people, other people. Jesus said, just don't do stuff to people who can do stuff back to you. Don't take out people and then spare. Okay, I took you out this week. Y'all take us out next week. No. Do some stuff for some people who can't pay you back and you know who can take you out. We're going to uh, get it just a little bit more than we'll shut down. We've already reached our, our, our time. Uh, but Abraham ministered uh, to his wife as well. Abraham ministered to his wife and to his family. Let me read this text here. We'll give you about five more minutes and then we'll, we'll shut down. And, and verse 9 through 15, and, and they said unto him, 
where is Sarah thy wife? And he said, behold, in the tent. And he said, I will certainly return unto thee according to the time of life. And lo, Sarah thy wife shall have a son. And Sarah heard it in the tent, which was behind him. Now Abraham and Sarah were old and well stricken in age, and it ceased, uh, and it ceased to be with Sarah after the manner of woman. Meaning she, her body was, it, it was advanced where she could not uh, uh, bear children. Plus, we already know from beforehand in Genesis that she was already bearing. She was not already have, have children. When, we, when Abraham and Sarah come on the scene, Abraham 75, Sarah 65. Therefore, Sarah laughed within her, laughed within herself, saying, after I am waxed old, shall I have pleasure, my Lord being old also? Uh, and the Lord said to Abraham, unto Abraham, wherefore did Sarah laugh, saying, shall I uh, of certainty bear a child which am old? And is there anything too hard for the Lord? At the time appointed, I will return unto thee according to the time of life, and Sarah shall have a son. Then Sarah denied, saying, I laugh not. For she was afraid, and he said, Nay, but thou didst laugh. And so Sarah in her tent, uh, uh, it was kind of, a, it was amusing that she would be able to, to bear a child, as the angels uh, told Abraham as they sat in fellowship. But Abraham was faithful to the, to the Lord. He became a channel of blessing to his wife and eventually his family that was later to come. Sarah had an important role. Sarah's role was important. Her name was changed just like Abram's name was changed as we saw last week in chapter 17. She had an important role to play in the working out of God's plan of salvation. Uh, she's in the hall of faith in Hebrews 11, 11. Sarah's in there by faith, Sarah. She's in the hall of fame, 1 Peter 3, 1 through 7, and also Romans 4, 18 through 21. Sarah is important. She's important. Women are important to God's plan. Look at all the women, all the significant women. You've got Sarah. You've got Hannah. You've got Rahab the harlot. You have Ruth that married Boaz, and Boaz begat Jesse. Jesse begat David, and David was a man after God's own heart. And out of that line is going to eventually come what? The Christ. So look at all those beautiful, significant sisters that were back in that time and their example that lives to us today. So women, we, we can never feel like, uh, well, what's my role? We don't have a role. Yes, sisters, you have a role. They had a role back then, they have a role now. They're part of that plan of God's salvation. So Sarah had a role to play. The Lord had come all the way, look at this. The Lord had come all the way from heaven to give Abraham and Sarah an announcement. At the same time next year, Sarah would give birth to a promised son. Now, today we have reveal parties. People do all these, you know, you've seen on videos, people have all these creative ways of revealing they're going to have a baby and what the sex of the baby is. But this is probably the greatest reveal party you've ever seen is that the Lord himself came down to bring Abraham and Sarah that news that the next time, this time next year, y'all will have a child. The news was so incredible that Sarah laughed and she questioned whether such a thing could happen to two elderly people. And we know that God's plan was for Abraham and Sarah to be well past dead. God was waiting. That's why all this time was taking place from the time that they were first promised. God is waiting on his timetable that they would be well past the time where Abraham would be able to produce seed and that Sarah, she was already, we know she was already bearing, but he's going to wait well past the time where women of even that time period were bearing children to where their bodies that already was depleted of anything that would allow them to sustain life. And so th this would be only by uh, the grace of God that this was going to happen. Abraham's laughter, uh, uh, Sarah laughed and, and questioned and kind of kind of like a questioning laugh. Uh, it can't get, <laughs> you, this is ridiculous. I can't do it. I'm, I'm old, I, you know, she, she's a, uh, Abraham's 99, she's 89. They can't, this can't happen to us. We're two old people. This can't happen. Abraham's laughter had been out of joyful faith in, in Genesis chapter 17, as Bob got, uh, uh, covered last week. Abraham's faith, Abraham was more out of joy uh, that, that this would, would one day happen. But Sarah's laughter was marked by unbelief, even though she had tried to deny it. She's like, no, I, no, I didn't laugh. I didn't laugh. And the angel said, nay, she did laugh. She did laugh. We, we heard her laugh. And there's a little depiction. There's the angel saying, uh, nay. She did laugh. And so we'll leave you right there uh, with those uh, few points. And we'll come back next week 
uh, uh, this one little incident has a lot more because we still got to get to Abraham and his compassion for Sodom and Gomorrah. So we'll take next week and deal with that because that's a whole nother section. The story turns as the angels get ready to depart. The two angels walk ahead and the Lord stays around and talks to Abraham and says, shall we tell Abraham what we intend to do down in the plan? And they reveal the plan. And so we're going to see Abraham's compassion for those lost people down there in Sodom and Gomorrah. So that'll be next week. We'll continue this with Genesis chapter 18.